crying holy 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 and they are doing this for eons of time today in our worship services you know after singing a song two times we get tired don't we let's be honest okay and we <laughs> we stand in the pews there and we are wondering why this worship leader does want to sing another song why is he repeating the same song over and over again doesn't he know other songs don't you see they are all very quiet in india when you are quiet it means they agree silence they say is golden you know but look at this seraphim they're going around and around and around the throne for eons of time and they never get tired you know why each time they go around they look at the face of god they cry holy then they another round they come they see another face of god they cry holy eons of time they are making e so many circles around and they are saying something new of god each time so they get so excited they cry holy 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 it's never never the same each time so if it's never the same each time you should never ever think you have come to the end of your pursuit when you think you have come to the end that's just the beginning it's just the beginning it's not the end so you should never ever fall short of pursuing after god because the ultimate goal is the full stature of the image of the lord jesus christ perfected in us and it is not easy you know we need to get all the clay out of us a lot of pruning work needs to take place until the image of christ jesus is chiseled in us when you stand before a mirror it should not reflect your image it should reflect the image of the lord jesus christ so that is the ultimate goal the fullness of the stature of the lord jesus christ that is why god has sent us the holy spirit to transform us from glory to glory second corinthians 13:8 38 tells us that from glory to glory that's the goal so that should be our pursuit and in that pursuit what are we required to do what are we required to have you know before the final appearance of the lord jesus christ it has been prophesized for thousands of years that there will be one final outpouring of the glory of god and for one final harvest of souls have you all heard of that so in that final outpouring of the harvest that's where everybody the young the old the good the big the fat everybody they all have their part in the final display of the glory of god everybody irrespective of who we are irrespective of whether you are a young christian or old christian irrespective of all that god is going to pour out his glory it's called the powers of the age to come that power this world not even the angels in heaven have ever seen yet nothing you know a few years ago i was preaching at a conference in louisiana and one afternoon as i was waiting on god i was visited by four angels and there was a chief among them he spoke to me he said we are the guardian angels of this state and we have come to give you an update of what has happened in this state so far so he narrated to me about uh, the events that took place when the storm katrina came and devastated louisiana so he narrated all the incident and then he said at this meeting 
God wants you to speak on the powers of the age to come. So I've never heard anything of that, you know. I've only heard of the phrase, powers of the age to come. It's found in Hebrews chapter 6. Other than that, I do not know anything about what does it mean, powers of the age to come. And he went on explaining to me what it meant. And then he said this, said the amount of glory that the power of the Holy Spirit that is going to be manifest in the last days, even we the angels in heaven have not seen such the power of the Holy Spirit yet. Now when he said that, it blew my mind off. See, all the angels in heaven who witness the power of the Holy Spirit in creation. See, God spoke and the Holy Spirit created. If that is nothing compared to what is to come in our days, then what is the powers of the age to come? We have never seen that power of the Holy Spirit yet. It's hidden in the wisdom of God. Can you imagine what a great privileged people we all are who are going to be filled with that power of the age to come? Can you imagine? All the prophets and the patriarchs who ever walked this earth has never seen such a power. The Lord Jesus Christ told me this, you know. He said, Moses will envy your days. So I thought to thinking now, for Moses to envy my days, he parted the Red Sea. So what are we going to do? For him to envy you. You cannot be parting any small stream, you know. <laughs> right? You cannot be parting a small stream. You have to do something greater. Powers of the age to come. You know, when Korah, Deton stood against Moses and they challenged his authority and when God vindicated the authority of Moses, Moses looked at them and he said, let this be the sign. If the earth will not open up under your feet and you go down alive to hell, and as soon as he spoke those words, the earth opened. You know, we talk about Elijah being caught up to heaven alive. And here you read about three guys who had the great privilege of going down alive to hell. Isn't that a great privilege? They did not die to go to hell, you know. They went alive to hell. And that happened by the word spoken by a prophet. Just a word he spoke. He did, not, he did not kneel down and pray for hours, cranking up the spirit. You know, in the old days, they have this car where you crank it up. No, 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 no more cranking, you know. He's speaking the word. Look at Elijah. He said, at my word, it will no more rain. That's it. Just that one word. And it did not rain for three years. Can you imagine what um, authority that rested upon Elijah? And the Lord Jesus said, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Peter, Paul, they will all envy your days. For them, you know, it took me a long time trying to understand that, you know. It was too mind-boggling to me. For all these great prophets and patriarchs who did great exploits for God, for them to envy our days, what are we going to do? We're going to do great and awesome things. Amen.
great and awesome things. That is the amount of power that is going to be vested and thrusted not only in your hands, even the little children. Even the little children. From the youngest baby, even a baby, you know, that sucks milk from the mother's breast. Even that baby will have this power. It will just stretch his hand and demons will depart. This written in Psalms 8-2. In the whole of last year, you know, we have a 24-hour television network called Angel TV. I'll talk about it tomorrow. So in that uh, network, the Lord told me to design special programs for babies, for little children, even for fetus in the womb. And, and I began to preach it. And little ba children, you know, babies began to get filled in the Holy Spirit. The fetus in the womb, six months and older, they get filled in the Holy Spirit watching our TV programs. Little children were getting filled in the Holy Spirit. So one mother brought this wonderful testimony to me. Her baby was eight months old. Got filled in the Holy Spirit watching our TV program. One day, her relative, a 13-year-old girl, visited them. And this girl came near the baby. The baby looked at her. First, it cried. This baby never cried at even strangers. But when this girl came, it just cried. And the, the, this 13-year-old girl was wondering, what's wrong? And then the mother came, and this, and this baby lifted up its finger and pointed at the girl and just smiled. A demon departed from that girl. The girl was possessed with a demon spirit. Eight-month-old baby. Psalms 8-2 was fulfilled. I was so thrilled, you know, when this testimony was reported to me. And we interviewed the mother and the little baby. And now that little baby is one and a half years old. And the miracle story continues. They, cast, they are doing what the scriptures are saying. These are the days. See how privileged you are. To live in such a time as this. How privileged you are. You are so privileged, so blessed that God is going to pour out His Spirit without measure upon everyone from the youngest to the oldest before we can receive this glory. Something needs to be done in us. That's my message this afternoon. It's titled, The Lamb. Now on 26 June 2014, at 9.50 in the morning, as I was waiting on God, meditating the word, drinking a cup of tea, suddenly I saw in a vision, a lamb appeared before me, real lamb, just like how you see me before you, about two and a half feet tall, it appeared about two feet away from me, never spoke a word, just stood and looked at me. And when I looked at the Lamb, I thought, oh, the Lamb of God has come before me. So I was about to bow down and worship the Lamb, when I felt a check in my spirit, no, take a good look at the Lamb. So when I saw the Lamb, there was no slain mark on the Lamb. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ has a slain Lamb of God, He has a mark of blood stain, like a cut around the Lamb's neck. Even today, you know, if you read Revelation chapter 8, 13, verse 8, it tells us like that. So when I looked, this Lamb did not have the slain mark. So I asked the Holy Spirit, what is this? The Holy Spirit said, it is a Lamb, but not the Lamb of God. Then what is this? He told me, this lamb represents sacrificial love. He said this, go and tell the people that they need to possess 
a sacrificial love in these last days in order to live through the last days in order to survive through the last days in the end times in the midst of all chaos that there will be in the midst of the rule of the antichrist in the midst of all the persecution and the tribulation that will be going on in the last days you need the sacrificial love to walk through those days so that is what the lamb represented then the holy spirit went on teaching me about the characteristics of a lamb which we must possess in this last days before you can receive the powers of the age to come so i saw this lamb it stood there motionless looked very very meekful and looked very unassuming that's how a lamb looks like you know it has no airs about it doesn't carry a name card have you ever seen a lamb carrying a name card i am apostle have the most high priest the most high holiness reverend doctor this that this that with a string of titles all over below the names and you need, they need three, two or three cards you know just with all the titles it's so comical this days you know sorry so comical with all these titles Have you ever seen a dog carrying a tag dog? <laughs> no, it doesn't do that. When it barks, oh, you know that's a dog. <laughs> Likewise, if you are an apostle, the very fruit of your ministry will advertise who you are. When you are a prophet. when you begin to walk in that realm the very fruit of your ministry will tell others who you are you don't have to carry a tag you know prophet <laughs> apostle <laughs> doctor if everybody becomes a doctor who's going to be a patient <laughs> somebody has to be a patient you know you know many many years ago an organization in kuwait they wanted to present me a honorary doctorate degree you know so they said oh we ha- our we have selected you we have studied your ministry blah 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 so we would like to present you with this award so please come to kuwait for a three days of meetings and then we will present you this award so i took it up before the lord in prayer said lord this was way back in i think the year early 2000 or late yeah must be 2000 you know so i took it up before the lord I said lord this i do not know who these people are they want to present me with this award shall i receive it you know the lord jesus christ is so kind he looked at me and he asked me how does your name sounds good Dr Sadhu Sundar Selvaraj or just Sadhu Sundar Selvaraj so i said it several times to myself you know <laughs> why are you laughing bruce <laughs> so I answered the Lord, Lord, just Sadhu Sundar Salvaraj sounds very good, and the Lord looked at me and said, I think so too. <laughs> <laughs> That settles the question. <laughs> so I wrote back to the organization, I am not fit for their award. Please give to somebody else who are worthier. You know. So I I decided to be a patient. <laughs> let everybody be a doctor 
my dear brothers and sisters there's no necessity to clap <laughs> remember this a lamb is unassuming it is motionless it stands in one place just remain motion unassuming and meekful this is what we need we need to cultivate this character and this quality what is that that summarizes the very nature of the lord jesus christ we want to walk in the powers of the age to come you want to walk in the miraculous you want to walk in the supernatural you want to be translated from place to place you want all that caught up to heaven like how john was you want all that the bottom line is this you must have the characteristics of a lamb walk in that sacrificial love be possessed with the sacrificial love a sacrificial lamb does not consider its own life but is willing to lay down its life for another that's what a lamb does you know do you like steak where does it come from someone died for you to enjoy a steak you know don't laugh ponda right a sheep died was killed so that you could enjoy a ripeye steak or a tea bone steak or nowadays they have the tea rack steak that uh, that's my own invention so big one you know bigger than a tea bone steak so i call it the tea rack steak see a sheep a lamb died so that you can enjoy something that's what a sacrificial lamb is all about you know it doesn't live for its own when you are filled with the sacrificial love of god you no more live for yourselves you're always willing to lay down your life for another that was the nature that was in the prophet moses if you read exodus chapter 32 when god wanted to destroy the israelites and start a brand new generation brand new people from moses he knelt down held on to the hands of god and he cried to god said lord you cannot do that if you will do that then strike me from the book of life or to use today's cliche would be over my dead body if you want to touch them first you need to kill me he was willing to put his life down for the salvation of the israelites that is the sacrificial love that is what we need in these last days what is the sacrificial love it is the crucified life only such a crucified life is counted worthy to receive power glory authority with god to move in the miraculous powers of the age to come in these last days the crucified life which is a politically incorrect statement to say in today's charismatic christianity in today's hyper grace teaching in today's seeker friendly teachings this is a bad word to use you don't talk about that everything has already been nailed on the cross so you can live your life in whatever way you want to live you know there an article appeared uh, i read it yesterday about a pastor in seattle preaching that a gay lifestyle is okay extramarital sex is okay all kinds of 
sexual orgies is okay. I don't want to go into the detail, no, it doesn't sound good. All is okay. All this has been preached right from the pulpit. My dear brothers and sisters, apostasy is not coming into the church, it's already there. It's already there inside the church. The church is more ungodly than the world outside. It's more ungodly. It's more heathen than any third world nations. She doesn't look like the bride of Christ, you know. She looks like Jezebel. That's how the church looks like. The false church, not the true church. The false church that grows big in numbers. It has to grow big in numbers because you have compromising ministers who preach a false gospel. You know, during Elijah's days, Queen Jezebel had on her payroll 850 false prophets. 850. They were on her payroll. Every day, they eat at her table. And you know, all these 850 false prophets, they were gays, they practiced homosexuality, they practiced all kinds of unclean sexual activities, and they offer their sperms as a sacrifice to Ashtaroth. The demons d demand all this, you know. They offer all these sacrifices. And Queen Jezebel, she kills the true prophets of God and drinks their blood. She does all this. This was going on in Israel during Elijah's time. All this was going on. Only one man stood apart, Elijah. And the entire nation was swept away by all these 850 false prophets, false teachers. And they went around the whole of Israel, setting up house churches, setting up cell groups, setting up satellite churches, and teaching all these false teachings all over the land. Okay, this is the way to live. Worship idols, practice immorality. As a result, the anger of God came upon Israel. We are no better today. The church, the supposed church of Jesus Christ is no better than the Old Testament Israel or even present day Israel. No better. You know, if not for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would have been perished long time ago like Sodom and Gomorrah. Only the blood of Jesus that is pleading before the throne of God. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Only the blood, not anything else. My dear brothers and sisters, we must learn to crucify our flesh, crucify the self, crucify all that is within us, that we may become like Christ. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, there you will find an angel comes and stands with a scroll in his hand, and he shouts at the top of his voice, who is worthy to open the scroll? And John looks around and no one was worthy to open the scroll. He wept much. As he was crying, an elder came and tapped on his shoulder. Don't cry. Look. The lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. He has prevailed to overcome. So when John was told, the lion has prevailed, he turned around to see the lion. When he turned around, instead of a lion, there was a slain lamb. A slain lamb. 
stood there. So what happened to the lion? We'll come back to the lion later. When he turned around, he saw a slain lamb. And the slain lamb, Re Revelation 5, 6 says, had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now the seven horns represents the sevenfold powers of God. The seven eyes represent the sevenfold prophetic anointing of God. Together with the power and with the prophetic anointing, together is the lion, which has all authority and all power given to it when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Matthew 28 verse 18 tells us like that. He himself declared, I have now have all power and all authority. My dear brothers and sisters, only they who have crucified themselves. Galatians 2.20 tells us, where Paul declares, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ Jesus lives me. I don't live anymore. I'm dead. Christ lives in me. You know, the scripture tells us that dead knows nothing. Right? The dead knows nothing. So if you are dead, then you are dead. You know nothing. If you know something, it means you have not died. You are just in a coma. Those who are in a coma will snap up, you know, to life. A few months ago, or last year, a famous racer, car racer, Michael Schumacher, world champion racer, he went skiing with his son, fell down, hit on his head, and went into a coma for eight long months. Nobody knew. Doctors gave up hope. And his wife, she told the doctor, Doctor, I have all this money. I'm willing to spend all our fortune if only my husband can be healed. The doctor told her, all your money cannot wake him from his sleep. It's too late. Let's pull the plug off. She didn't want to do it. Then they said, okay, you just have a vegetable. So they spent tons of money and they converted their mansion into a state-of-the-art hospital with all facility. So Shoemaker was transferred to the mansion, not knowing how long he will last, whether he will wake up or not. Have you heard of Ariel Sharon, the former Prime Minister of Israel? He went into a coma eight long years and he died. He didn't get up. He didn't wake up. He died. So what's going to happen to Shoemaker? I don't know. I don't know Shoemaker personally, you know, but somehow I felt saddened. He's a nice guy. I read about him, very humble man, no ass about him. So I felt sad that this has happened to him. Then suddenly, one day, he woke up. Woke up to his normal self. Although he could not race anymore, but he was not a vegetable. It was normal. So, people who are in a coma, can get up to their normal life. So a, a Christian who is in a coma will rise up to their old sinful nature, life. But if you truly die, then you are dead. If you are dead, then Christ Jesus lives in you. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ Jesus lives in you. And the life that I now live, I don't live anymore. I live by the faith of the Son of God who lives in me and through me. This is the crucified life we need to come to live now. Romans 8.13 
And Colossians 3, 5 tells us like that. So first, you need to crucify ourselves. Secondly, we need to crucify our passions. Galatians 5, 24 says that. Crucify your passions. Those passions that are unsanctified. The passions that are ungodly. The passions that are covetous. Crucify that. Third, the world is crucified unto me. The Apostle Paul says like that in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. All the things in the world, they should not hold on to you. Nothing wrong to have a nice mansion house. Nothing wrong. Nothing, to, nothing wrong to have a nice luxury car. Nothing wrong to have a career. Nothing wrong to have tons of money with you. However, all this should not hold you. They should not become an idol in your life. If the Lord says, let go, you should be willing to let go. You should not be like Lot's wife. Lot's wife came out of Sodom, you know. But Sodom was inside her. The Sodom that was inside her did not come out. It came along with her because it was inside her. And that was what made her turn back and look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it was inside her. She was not crucified to Sodom. She carried Sodom with her. So when the judgment fell on Sodom, it also fell upon her. I'm crucified. The world is crucified to me. All the luxuries that we have, the possessions that we have, they should never ever become idols in your life. The ministry must not become an idol. The church must not become an idol. Your church. Your children should not become an idol. Your spouses must not become an idol. You yourself must not become an idol to yourself. You are dead. If you are dead, the dead knows nothing. The dead knows nothing. Chew on it. Meditate on it. The dead knows nothing. I pondered and pondered on that scripture, you know. The dead knows nothing. That's true. I've been to many funerals. I, st I stood at the coffin and I looked at the body. No matter the good, the bad or the ugly you speak, the dead knows nothing, you know. You know, in funerals, everybody who comes and goes, they'll speak glowing tribute of eulogy, right? The poor dead man doesn't hear all that. Why can't we say nice things when people are alive? <laughs> right? Speak nice things when they are alive. Why speak nice, nice things when they are gone? It doesn't matter to them anymore. When people are alive, we speak bad about them. We criticize them. We speak all evil. We gossip about them. But when they are dead and gone, we say, Oh, such a wonderful saint. We are great hypocrites, you know. And we say, oh, the church has lost a fine saint. Say that when they are alive. Say that when they are alive. Then they can hear. The dead knows nothing. Which means, you crucify yourselves to all pride. All manner of pride. You are dead. When we are willing to die to self. Galatians 2.20 should be the foundation. It is the basic foundation of the Christian life. Unfortunately, it is not taught in the churches. You don't go around naming it and claiming it. You know, when this doctrine first came out in the 80s, I got sucked into it. 
God said, praise God. You name it, you claim it. So I didn't have a car during those days, you know. So I wanted a car. And I used to f fancy Rolls Royce. You know the book I read, you know. Whatever you desire, you name it, you claim it. So I began to pray, Lord, I want a car. It must be Rolls Royce. Because they say, you know, be specific. Because the angels will have trouble getting you a car if you just simply say you want a car. There are so many cars, right? So I said, all right. Lord, I prayed very sincerely, you know, very seriously. I knelt down, I prayed. Lord, I want a car. It must be Rolls Royce. And the model is silver cloud and a white color. So I was down to the specifics so that the angels will never make a mistake. Every day I prayed this prayer, you know. Every day, sincerely I prayed. For how many days I lost count. One day, I had gone to the mall. And as I was walking past by on the roadside, and there I saw this car. The exact model, the exact color, and a Rolls Royce. So I thought, oh Lord, my car. So I, you know, they said, you should also claim it, you know. So I went very near to the car. I looked around if anybody was watching. I laid my hand and said, Lord, this is my car. This is my car. This is the very car. I said, Lord, take a good look, Lord. So that no mistakes are made. Take a good look. Silver cloud, white color, Rolls Royce. So when I was satisfied that the Lord had looked at the car, <laughs> then I took my hand off. So after I had finished shopping, I came home. So when my afternoon prayer time came, I knelt down to pray. So when I was praying, the presence of the Lord came into my room. And he asked me a question. Son, what do you want? A car or a Rolls Royce? So I looked at that. What is so difficult that the Lord should ask this question? So I said, Lord, I want a car. It should be a Rolls Royce. So after a little silence, the Lord asked me the question again. Son, what do you want? A car or a Rolls Royce? So I pondered again, no? Why doesn't the Lord know what a Rolls Royce is all about? Okay, so I said, Lord, I want a car, but it should be a Rolls Royce. Third time, the Lord asked me this question. What do you want? A car or a Rolls Royce? So I pondered, you know, something must be wrong. Why doesn't the all-knowing God know what a Rolls Royce is? Right? Something is wrong. So as I pondered and I pondered, then I realized something is not wrong with God, something is wrong with me. <laughs> so I got very quiet. I asked the Lord, Lord Jesus, what is the problem? Am I doing something wrong? So the Lord asked, told me, if you need to go from point A to point B, an ordinary car will do. But if you need a Rolls Royce, it's just a flashy pride. So what do you want now? He asked me this question. So I fell on my face. I realized how stupid, how foolish I was. I fell on my face and I repented. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I have foolishly asked for the wrong thing. Lord, from, to go from point A to point B, I don't even need a car. A bicycle will do. I can even walk from point A to point B. So I said, Lord, let me rephrase my question one more time. Lord, I need a car to go from point A to point B. But if you feel that walking from point A to point B is also sufficient, good for me, 
I will accept it. Let your holy will be done. And the Lord Jesus was so thrilled and so pleased by what I prayed. He granted my request and I began walking from point A to point B. <laughs> so all our foolishness, you know, all our foolishness, dying to self, dying to self. Isn't it true? An ordinary small car can get you from point A to point B. Nothing wrong, you know, for a rich person to buy a Rolls Royce. Nothing wrong. But we should not covet after it. It all boils down to the matter of the heart. That's where it ends, you know. The heart attitude. What is the attitude of your heart? Are you covetous? Are you coveting? That what it boils down to. Owning a car, owning a plane, is necessary for the ministry, fine. But when you covet, that becomes sinful. Die. Be crucified to the world. The Lamb represents sacrificial love. The Lamb of God offered itself to be slain for the people. For the bride. If you read Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and chapter 21, verse 9, it talks about the Lamb's bride. Why is it called the Lamb's bride and not just called the bride of Christ? Because the bride was purchased by the blood of the Lamb. She is who she is because of the sacrificial Lamb. Not anything else. He gave himself totally. That's what a shepherd does. A true shepherd willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Laying down its life can have many connotations. Physical laying down of its life or laying down of yourself, your personal so that God can use you to wipe away the tears of another. Today is my off day. Please don't call me. Oh, I'm on vacation. Don't call me. Don't send me your emails. Turn off everything. You know, when you decide to take up the cross and follow the Lord, you are on call 24-7. On call 24-7. Anytime the Holy Spirit calls you, you have to say, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. What would you want me to do? That is walking in sacrificial lamb. Sacrificial life. The sacrificial love, how shall we define it? What does it mean, sacrificial love? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 8 very beautifully explains the many facet of the sacrificial love. Love suffers long. Love is not envious. Love is kind. Love is patient. When you fill with this sacrificial love, you will exhibit all these qualities of it, like the rainbow. You know, light is colorless, but when it passes through a prism, it comes out, it displays seven colors. In the same way, when you're filled with the sacrificial love, the seven qualities of the sacrificial love is displayed one by one by one. It's kind, it's patient, it's long-suffering, it's self-controlled, very disciplined. This is the facet of the sacrificial love. If you want to know whether do you have the love of God inside you or not, check your love with 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8. If you don't find anything mentioned in Corinthians that's in you, it means you don't have love. You don't have. But we don't have to be barren. We can be fruitful in that love. 
Amen? When the more you begin to fellowship with the Lord Jesus, when you more you begin to walk with God, then that love will begin to flow. First, ankle level, then knee level, then waist level, then deep swim up to neck level. The four stages, it increases from glory to glory. The sacrificial love of God. The sacrificial love, another identification of it is, it is selfless. It loves to the end. John chapter 15, 13, verse 1. The Lord Jesus said, and he looked at his own and he loved them to the end. What does it mean to love to the end? If you read Matthew chapter 26, verses 47 to 50, when Judas Iscariot came into the garden of Gethsemane to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. See, he's coming with a mop. In the night hour, the...